time from now. There we go, excellent. Ah, okay. Hello, I see these numbers slowly emerging. Seven eager beans. Uh, thank you for coming. Twelve. Oh, this is exciting. It's like the lottery somehow. People are like slowly entering. Um, feel free to use the chat to introduce yourselves. We'll just have a few gentle moments as people arrive. We have got 170 people uh, who signed up for tonight's webinar on UK flower growing and sustainable floristry. So as these sort of numbers slowly emerge, I will generally witter at you um, for a few moments uh, so you can kind of settle and uh, familiarize yourself with your Zoom controls. We are in a webinar tonight, so you can be relaxed in your environment. We can't see you. You might be in your pajamas, you might be eating your dinner, you could be sat stroking your cat. No one can see, so you can relax and enjoy yourself. But like I said, feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat if you like, or you can stay in delicious silence and just enjoy these moments as we sort of like come together. Um, so my name's Robin and I work for the Landworkers Alliance as well as the Guy Foundation. I'm a very lucky person. And um, I would just give us a few moments to allow some people to arrive. I'll generally sort of like continue mildly, hopefully amusingly uh, speaking <laughs> until we feel we've got a little bit of a numbers enough for us to begin tonight's session. If you have joined late, or if you know that somebody has joined late and they haven't got my email that I sent out, I sent the last one very recently. I'm just gonna post the link in the chat so that if you've got friends who are looking to join and for whatever reason they haven't received the email, please feel free to send that to them so that they can join us this evening, that's fine. No problem to join a little bit late. Like I said, if you've got friends and family or colleagues who are looking to join and they haven't got the link because if you join very, very late, then you wouldn't have received that message just in the last few moments. So please feel free to share that with your, your friends, your families, your colleagues who might be wanting to join. And it's lovely to see a few people posting in the chat. So I can see Alice and Penny, is that? Penny Hemming? No, South Wales. I've seen who's joined today is Penny Hemming. She's a wonderful flower grower and vegetable grower who goes at Riverford Field Kitchen. She's been an inspiration to the Southwest growers and her amazing uh, array of dried flowers that she grows. And she fills the Riverford Field Kitchen with these beautiful dried flowers. This is incredible dried corns, blue and red popcorn that she fills in the kitchen. It's gorgeous. So this is obviously we've got Jez. Ah, oh, Jez, hello, Jez. I know Jez very well. She's a brilliant, gorgeous woman and a fantastic flower grower. We've got Tia, who's in the Mendips, and Anne from Dorset. Maybe you say Annie or Anne, I'm not sure. So welcome to everybody. We've got an Anna, who's in the Forest of Dean. Tisa, we've got Nikki, an all year round grower at the Flower Patch CIC. Okay, excellent. So maybe people can check them out. So Rhiannon at Blue Hill Flora from South Wales. Brilliant, Nikki in Cornwall. Joe from Brighton. I wonder if I know if you're connected to the Southeast Land Workers Alliance coordinators. Maybe I met you at Ed's Farm in Liphook, maybe not. We've got the lanes of Mid Sussex. Okay, welcome. Okay, great. This is lovely to see you. Ah, oh, someone from Glasgow, Amy in Glasgow, Megan from Oh, Meg Help Salmon Market Garden. Massive praise to Salmon Market Garden. These are incredible bunch of growers and they're also the regional coordinators for the Land Workers Alliance and they do incredible work galvanising um, grassroots activists across the East Anglia region. So a huge praise for them. It's wonderful for you to join us tonight to uh, listen about UK flower growing and sustainable flourishy. So a huge welcome to Salmon Growers. Lovely to have you. So we've got Karen from East Sussex, Julia in Glastonbury, She's part of Feed Avalon. This is fantastic. Okay, lovely to have you all. Jenny from Leeds. Okay, John from West Wales, hoping to start growing next year. Okay, so John, feel free to post your questions to Sarah and Rory and Camilla. Um, if you want to know some specifics about growing, you can ask them the top tips. Rosanna from Bristol. This is fantastic. So most of you are probably quite familiar with Zoom now. 
Um, this is a webinar, it's not a meeting. We sadly can't see your faces, but it's really lovely to hear your, you know, to, to read your names and where you're from in the chat. So please continue to post your, your, you know, your welcomes in the chat. That's really lovely. And throughout today's talk, you can post your questions or comments. And you, there's a special question and answer box. So if you've got a question, you can pop that in the question and answer box, and then we can see that really clearly. And you can post your comments or thoughts or suggestions in the chat box at any time throughout the, throughout the webinar this evening. So this is lovely. We've got Luke from Bristol. And Catherine from the Isle of Skye, <gasps> lovely. Okay, fantastic, I'm very jealous. I really want to go up there. Okay, so we're five minutes past now. So I will launch fully into my official spiel to welcome you all this evening. So hello and welcome to tonight's webinar on UK flower growing and sustainable floristry. So my name is Robin Minogue and I'm here representing the Land Workers Alliance as part of the collaborative series of webinars funded by Farming the Future. It is my great privilege to be joined this evening by Sarah and Rory from We Grow Cralla, based in Dorset, and Camilla from Wolves Lane Flower Company in London. So the Land Workers Alliance is working in collaboration with the Organic Growers Alliance, the Seed Sovereignty Programme, which is part of the Guy Foundation, and the CSA Network, who run these monthly webinars, and they normally fall on the last Wednesday of each month, and these will continue into 2022, so stay connected. So the webinar programme focuses on practical teaching and farmer to farmer knowledge exchange from farmers and growers across the UK and Ireland. The series is designed to increase knowledge exchange and learning on both the politics and practice of agroecology and food sovereignty. If you are interested in being involved in running a webinar or proposing a talk, then feel free to get in touch with me personally at robin.minogue at landworkersalliance.org.uk and I can put my email contact in the chat for you to contact me directly. Before I introduce our speakers this evening, I wanted to just read a sentence or two from the Farming the Future to remind us of the vision behind this webinar series. And I think it sets the scene very well for tonight's talk. So, Farming the Future say, we stand on the prepices, pre prepices, I'm going to say that right, I'm going to start again. We stand upon the precipice of great change for food and farming in the UK. It is time to act anew and work together to replace our outdated industrial food system built on the extraction of resources, the unjust treatment of animals and of people that leads to inequalities. We seek to build a food system built on equity, harmony and compassion while renewing our relationship with the land and those that feed us. I think that was a really beautiful way to introduce Sarah and Rory of We Grow Colour and Camilla of Wolves Lane Flower Company. So in researching to prepare for this webinar, I was introduced to the work of Sarah and Rory at We Grow Colour. From simply looking at their website, I was absolutely filled with joy, which I'm sure will make them very happy because they set as their kind of three core words for their focus as joy, creativity, and connection. Sarah and Rory work in harmony with nature, as well as using flowers to build connection. And their story is one of heart, one of justice, and one of beauty. And Camilla and Marianne co-run Wolves Lane Flower Company in London, and they describe themselves as flower obsessives, committed to a belief that beauty and diversity needn't be compromised at the expense of the environment. And they grow on a micro urban farm and are part of a new wave of farmer florists committed to offering ethical, beautiful flowers while spreading the word about seasonality. And it is an honour and a privilege to have this time together with these three growers. And I hope that we will just speak in an open and relaxed way about what it means to grow flowers in the UK at this time. And I've invited Sarah and Rory to share their story and they will speak in turn, starting with Sarah and Rory and then Camilla. And then we've left a lot of time at the end so we can answer your questions. So please feel free to ask whatever you wish. And don't be afraid to ask those big questions that maybe we don't have the answers for, as well as those super nerdy grower questions that I know that you love and um, I ask that you post your comments or questions in a spirit of respect and friendship and you can post these questions all the time through the talk but know that we will come to them at the end and we'll do them all together at the end. Okay so it is my pleasure and I will hand over to you Sarah and 
Rory who will go first. Can we hear you? I think you're still on mute, but maybe you're just preparing. Hi there. there we go. Hi everyone, um, we're so excited to be here this evening um, and we know that there's there are lots of you, um, all of you who are as keen on growing flowers as we are. Um, so we are um, We Grow Colour, my name's Sarah and this is Rory Hello. Um, and in this presentation we're basically going to be outlining our growing journey so far. Um, for those of you who followed us on Instagram um, you'll know that we are very new growers and we're coming up to this um, end of our second year um, and you know so next year you know, we'll be going into our third season um we're going to be discussing our journey so far our move from bristol to dorset um, um talking about setting up um in this brand new space um and some of our sort of key key values and keywords um that underpin our business so um in Bristol, um, we were growing in our back garden, um, and it was, it's a very, um, it was a small space, only 40 meters squared with the total number of beds. Um, but having um, decided to um, explore flower growing um, in 2019, um, we, we we're told that you know you can do it on any scale and we were really inspired by this um and we wanted to see what would be possible in an urban environment um so we this was in 2019 we did a lot of research so some biennials so some annuals ready for a kind of research year in um 2020 and in the spring as we all know um it was the start of the pandemic and suddenly the world had changed and we were faced with um, an environment where there were no um, florists couldn't be open um, and we had you know people were obviously in a state of shock and we had um, a garden full of flowers and we couldn't do the kind of research we'd anticipated doing so we decided to just put it out there into the world and say you know would anybody like to buy from us we have these these flowers and the response was absolutely amazing so this is where we started off um you will have seen a picture in the previous slide of our um, e-bike and we just started cycling these bouquets around um the city providing real connection between people who couldn't who couldn't see each other for the first time in this way um so we um yes yeah, so we we were growing in this really small space um we focused on doing a small number of varieties um and one of the things that we were inspired by was doing a course with organic blooms um who absolutely amazing growers um and we we're really inspired by their ethos and they were so encouraging of saying you can just um grow with a small number of of um, seedlings, for example, you don't need to be doing meters and meters. Um, you can have six plants and see how it works for you. Um, so trialing on this tiny scale was really, really useful. Um, and that was our only option. We used the no dig method to create our beds. And as we put on the slide, we had very, very poor soil. Um, and one section was this well patch on the bank of a river and it literally was a rubble heap. So we were quite, we were unsure if, if we were gonna be able to make anything grow there, but it, it worked really well. And one of the key um, sort of takeaways from that time was, um, or was joining Flowers from the Farm, who are an amazing organization um, who, uh, I think they represent <clears throat> well over a thousand um, growers now in the UK. And they're, you know, they're, it was such a great way of connecting with people doing something similar to us and to um, share knowledge. And we connected with other growers in Bristol and in um, North Somerset who 
we could buy in from because obviously growing on the scale like this we we could only supply a certain number of flowers so buying in buckets every week developing these relationships with um other key other growers um was just fantastic and actually i feel like we've made some sort of lifelong friends in in those people um so um I'm going to hand over to, to Rory, who is going to talk us through our move because we decided to move from Bristol um, to Dorset. And um, this has obviously been a big, big shift in moving from this urban space um, with its limitations and now moving to a rural environment. Okay. Um, hiya. So um, I am from. West Dorset originally and grew up there and we nine weeks ago moved into the house that I grew up in which is kind of crazy but um, it it all worked out the stars aligned we wanted more space my parents wanted to wanted less space effectively to have to deal with um, and so they, we bought the house off them and they moved into the next village along or next but one. So there are a lot of reasons for us doing that. We, we wanted to be closer to our family. Sarah has family around here as well. Um, we, um, we thought, it, you know, for, for supporting Sarah's well-being and mental health, mine too, and our daughters being back here would be a good thing. Um, I have a massive connection to this place, is where I grew up. Um, and it's a, it's a little tiny cottage, but with a big plot of land. And I say big, it's about a third of an acre, all told. Um, but it's big enough right now for what we need. Um, so we, you know, and part of the aspect of this is you know the massive privilege that we're able to do this we feel grateful all the time and um it's about the stewardship of this piece of land and now we're, we're bringing up the third generation of this family here which is i think quite a special thing and quite rare in this day and age for people to know the same piece of ground for even three generations whereas you know in times past there would be multiple multiple generations would stay in the same place which doesn't happen so much now so um that's where we where we are um we there's a there's an aspect of of how how it is living in a rural place that that is very new to Sarah and is yeah you know, I'm still learning about it and my parents learned about it because they moved into there in the in the mid 70s they were hippies we they were doing the whole good life thing you know we had goats and and they grew all the veg and everything there um, and there there are challenges with that with the you know the especially in the Days when I was a kid, people were very sort of small C conservative. They they, they were quite resistant to a lot of these ideas. Um, but my parents made it work. They got on with people, and you know, even you know, they were in the hunt saboteurs, and everybody around was fox hunting all the time. You know, is that kind of dynamic? But they made it work, and we're learning from them. Of how we can move on like that. Um, so that's where we have moved to. And we're now in the process of setting, setting up our new space. And there's a lot of thinking been going on in the last few months. Um, so Really, one of the first things I want to say is, is about the, you know, this kind of buzzword at the moment of rege regenerative agriculture, or it, I mean, it's probably horticulture in our case. Um, 
it's it's funny that in a, it, where we are now, it's merrily regenerating itself, in the sense that the the hedgerows, the the wild plants are moving in at a massive rate. There there are really quite large trees there now that weren't there when I was a kid, um, you know, 35 odd years ago. Um, it, it will turn into a forest eventually, if it was left to its own devices. Now, the, the thing is, we, we want to grow things there. So we're trying to balance the, the is a wonderfully biodiverse landscape, there are, you know, there's dog rose and bryony and all sorts growing up all the hedgerows. We don't want to bulldoze all that away and wring maximum profit from it. But at the same time, we need space. Um, so we're trying to strike a balance. So for instance, one of the pictures here, you can see I've taken out, a, started the process of taking out an old dry stone wall between our plot and the field next door. Um, to gain us, that gains us about three meters width. Um, and I'm making a dead hedge up against where it was as a windbreak and as somewhere to put all the prunings. Um, and there we're gonna plant a, a kind of shrub hedge of floristry shrubs, things that are gonna be useful for us. Um, for instance, so we um, we have to do these things. We're, I mean, one of the big contrasts is we we were in this urban place where we felt we had to create a like a precious oasis of of um, biodiversity and and try and try and do our growing to encourage everything to come in. Um, and we did quite well in that. We managed to, you know, we were awash with hoverflies and bees and everything by the end of two seasons of doing what we did there. Here, they're all here anyway. And but the 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 challenge, I suppose, is to get the most out of this space. One of the things is we 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 have to move stuff. There's no doubt in my mind. But I'm not too worried about a lot of it because it's, it's not as if we, we're unique here. The, the whole valley that we're in is full of these habitats. Okay, so I'm trying to preserve as much as we can as close to us. But we're going to have to take down a few trees. There's a, there's a massive sycamore that's shading out the whole bottom part of our plot. And we're, we're getting it taken down. It's too big for me to take down and it's in the phone lines and stuff. So we're getting a tree surgeon in, he's gonna cut it down. But there's another one 50 feet down the road, down the lane. And it's, it's things like that, it's, it's that balance. So we're doing the infrastructure now, just to give you an idea of what we've got, the size of the plot, um, the main growing area, just the beds in the in the front part is is only 160 square meters i worked out which is a 25th of an acre um the whole plot is a third of an acre now there's lots of marginal land and and slopes and it goes it winds around in quite strange ways around the house and it goes up the hill um we're working out ways how, of how to use a lot of that marginal land, um, which I'll get onto later, actually. We're quite high up. We're on the, on the kind of south side of the Dorset Downs, really. We're 600 feet up, but we're in a valley, so it's quite sheltered. There's quite a lot of trees around. It gets windy. It gets very foggy, but it's not blowing an absolute gale like it is at the top of the hill. You know, when you go up there, you, you get blown off your feet, but not where we are, luckily. 
um, it slopes slightly southeast. Um, the soil is clay with loads of flints in it over green sand and a bit of chalk. Um, and that's another very good reason for doing no dig because it's really impossible to dig. If you want to dig any sort of a hole, you've got to get the pickaxe out, um, basically. So we are very much into no dig for that reason and for lots of others um, too. Can you stick it on the next yeah. one? So uh, the next thing I want to talk about is, is using what we've got. We, um, we're trying to do set this up with kind of minimal impact and trying to trying to use the resources that we have available so for instance we've got a lot of wood around um, these hedgerows that i've talked about they're going to be managed more um, and moved outwards slightly to give us more space so but that creates a lot of wood um, there's a lot of hazel a lot of ash and sycamore most of which i'm going to coppice i've already started on the some of the big hazels um, we're going to use that those coppiced bits there's so many uses we've already we bought a chipper so we're chipping a lot of the stuff using as mulch and um using a lot of it just straight on the muddy bits for now because it's very muddy and i'm just chipping it straight onto the parts um which is soaking up the mud making it easier to walk on um these dead hedges that i've re referred to before um plant supports we have so many poles and theoretically we'll have hazel poles ash poles forever because we we can just keep coppicing them and that's that's a wonderful thought uh, you know we don't need to go down the the local diy place and buy tantalized poles and if they rot we just put in some new ones um so then the other thing, the other use of this chipper is composting. Um, and it was a big investment, this chipper, but it, I feel like it's, it's worth it already. There's so much ivy and brambles and things that are, that are creeping in. Um, I mean, one thing I want to say about the ivy is I'm very cognizant of how important ivy is from a biodiversity prospect. But some of it's got to go because it's in in the way, and that's that's I think one of our big um, philosophies at the moment is that things that are in the way have to move because we can't do what we need to do otherwise. But we're trying to do it thoughtfully. Okay, so there's a few big trees that have got mature ivy growing up them that we're going to leave, but a lot of it has to go. So we're putting it through this chipper, which does um green stuff as well it does ivy beautifully just chops it up into little bits composting that and it's already is going great guns getting really hot and we've got bags and bags and bags of this stuff already so it, it's really good and again that will grow it'll keep growing we'll keep using it um we've got loads of other resources leaf mold um we got our manure from down the road. We're going to do no dig beds with this well rotted cow manure that we um, from the local farmer, and he's got tons and tons of it. So you know, there's a picture there of the first trailer load. Um, the other major thing that I want to talk, talk about here is I referred to the marginal land before. You know, there's a picture on the bottom of. There's an orchard, what well, was an orchard at the back that is ma majorly overgrown. Some pretty mature apple trees, 40 odd years old that my dad planted, but they're, they're covered in ivy. They're, we're going to open that space out, but I want to use a lot of those kind of spaces as we're going to do kind of the permaculture guild thing 
around those. They're, they're pretty unhealthy at the moment. They're too shaded, but we're going to use things like comfrey and we're going we're to try and get double uses out of a lot of this. So the comfrey we're going to plant to help the fruit trees, other things like lemon balm and stuff around there as well. Um, and they're going to help the fruit trees. Then we can use the crop from the comfrey for making fertilizer and stuff. And we've also got plenty of nettles everywhere. Um, and yeah, so, and there are various other bits of marginal land in hedgerows and stuff that we're going to try and slot in plants that are going to be useful for us. Um, and I think that is all I have to say really about, about that stuff. Back to Sarah. So um, we've put sustainable floristry, why flowers? Um, so, you know, we know that flowers can be thought of as a luxury um, and a non-essential item um, when compared to something like growing food. Um, but we <clears throat> feel that they are, they're really, you know, important um, when we're looking at the well-being of um, not only ourselves, but um, the planet. Um, and in terms of the sustainability perspective, um, you know, if we're even looking at Brexit um, and the cost of um, importing flowers, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of the impact on um, the environment. Um, we think, you know, this growing local um, and growing, you know, using no pesticides. I know that, you know, many of you will, will be um, aware of all of this, um, but this feels like um, a small part that we can play um, in, in, you know, supporting um, the, um, the climate fight. Um, so, so one of our key words is joy. And, you know, it was brilliant to hear Robin saying that she went on our website and, um, you know, um, felt joy and that is sort of feedback that we get a lot um, and one of the um, kind of disclaimers I want to say about this word is that um, we feel it for us personally it comes from quite a grounded place there's an awareness that not everybody feels joy um, that there you know there are some um, incredibly challenging things happening um, at the moment across the world and within the UK um, and that people are really struggling um, and so you know I can reflect and I'm happy to share I've always been really open about this but I have um, you know dealt with my own bereavement and grief depression so I've I kind of had those two two sides I'm, we're really really aware of how challenging the world can be and but also how essential having um, some joy is. It's essential to try and find those um, moments in the day. And that is where how we came to flowers in a way. Um, well, I certainly did. And I know many of you do did as well. Um, and getting hands in the earth, seeing what can be grown um, and seeing this, you know, working with colour in this way, um, has been hugely, hugely beneficial to me and, you know, and I know to other people. Um, and it's been really interesting choosing varieties of flowers based on um, the colour that they give. And I know that um, some people that I know think it's quite funny that I, I don't really use white very much. I know there's some very pale Achillea in the right hand bouquet. Um, and people, you know, I know so many people who can work with neutral um, shades in the most amazing manner. Um, unfortunately, I can't do that. I don't really know how to use them. And I'm so drawn to these really kind of dual colours and the, the bright pop. Um, and, you know, I, obviously I kind of, and I wear lots of bright colour. Um, and people, you know, have been really, really responsive to this. Um, so we're, we're choosing varieties um, because we've been growing on such a small scale. We're choosing varieties um, that, that, that spark joy in us, um, that we absolutely love. We don't have the space to be growing things that we're a bit unsure about. And that's the other thing about this network of growers that we have, um, that we, we can buy in 
um, and we can and people are beginning to understand you know kind of kind of what we what we love um, and the other thing I want to mention is around using herbs um, this is another area that I've been interested in for a long time and was one of the first um, the, the way I got into growing. Um, I'm interested in herbs um, for so many different reasons. Their health benefits, the fact that you can use them in um, cooking, the, the fact that they are an amazing cut flower, the, the, they're really sensory and really grounding. Um, and the fact that you can, um, you know, one of the things that I just, I love doing is, kind of, you know, is when I'm stripping stems is, is um, is kind of being really in that moment and how it can um just just the scent is quite extraordinary um so going to our next keyword which is creativity um we both have creative backgrounds um rory was a musician and um my background is in printmaking um and i did a degree in um textile and surface pattern and I think um, one of the things that's been amazing for me is to finally find um, a way of uh, connecting in with this creativity um, using flowers. And again, connecting in with that colour. Um, and I, I've worked in a number of different spaces, um, which um, teaching workshops and working with different communities and how we can engage um, in creativity and the creative process. And I was doing that in relation to digital technology, which is very different to this, but it's really amazing to be able to bring these two kind of sides of my life together um, and you know, really kind of explore um, different creative mediums. And I do want to, to mention here, you know, we're at, again, we're at the beginning of this journey and there are so many incredible growers, so many incredible florists um, who are doing really, really inspiring work um, on completely sustainably that, you know, one of the things that people can be quite surprised about is that, you know, um, none of this is dyed. We're not using any of these dyed um, materials at all. The dried flowers that we use, um, oh, they can all keep their colour. Um, so it's kind of raising awareness around that as well. Um, and I know there are many, many people doing that. Um, and one of the sort of, again, we're just setting up nine weeks in only, but our, our vision really is to, um, to be able to run workshops and again allow people to sort of tap into this creative side connect in with this color um, create, um, connect in with creating um, and and that again being used as a tool for well-being so um, our final word is connection um, and I want to mention here about my refugee heritage um, because a lot of people will be aware that um, we from the very beginning have given 10% um, of our profits to marginalised communities. And as we started, um, we knew this was something that we felt very strongly about. Um, but we this year have really honed in on what's important. And um, my grandparents um, were Jewish refugees, one from Germany and one from Vienna in Austria. And my granny came from Vienna on the kinder transport when she was 11 with her nine year old sister unaccompanied um, and was supported by a British family. And you know, so this is a very strong thread that's run through our family. Um, and I feel the, the kind of, and when we're seeing the kind of plight of refugees, it's so topical at the moment, it's particularly in the light of, um, you know, climate change and the um, atrocities that are going on across the world. Um, I, you know, I personally feel this very deeply and feel a connection with this. And actually this led to me um, seeing, um, or sorry, finding out about We Are Bread and Roses um, and having spoken to um, uh, Olivia Weatherly about it, um, we're going to be doing some um, work with them in the new year. We're gonna be ambassadors and we are going to be um, um, having a dedicated uh, dry bouquet and dedicated fresh bouquet where 25% of the profits will be going to We Are Bread and Roses and their, um, their programs which teach um, refugee women in London and um, sustainable floristry. So again, it's looking at their well-being. it's um, signposting to services that they might need for support, it's teaching English and it's teaching um, sustainable floristry using the seasons. And this, this um, way of working completely fits with our values. Um, 
so no, I, so we feel a real, real sense of connection to um, to refugee organisations and um, and those who advocate for refugees. Connection again to our own well-being and to the well-being of others. Um, we've mentioned this a lot but this is something that underpins a lot of what we're doing um connection to our close and wider community um and this is you know our immediate um uh customers audience um and then different community groups um and working in the city you know i i've met so many different people and it's kind of bringing all those different um people together a connection with nature that Rory has spoken a lot about um and an engagement with relevant issues um and important issues and we're not prepared to just um, it's not for us all about the pretty flowers that we're growing. They do have beauty, but there's a deeper meaning that we feel is really important to, to share, to share. Um, and another thing is connection between other growers. So this cooperation and collaboration, given this, the situation that we currently find ourselves in, um, you know, it, moving forward, trying to work to more collaboratively um, seems like vital and the only way really. And since we've moved to Dorset, we've already met up with lots of people um, from Flowers from the Farm. And I mean, I've probably met a good 15 growers, which is amazing and it's so welcoming. And everyone has just said the more growers, you know, the more there is the better. Um, and also kind of opening up those conversations about how we can supply the floristry industry. Um, which is a whole other topic. Um, so, so yeah, so those are all kind of, you know, little threads that tie in for us to, to talk about um, in relation to connection. Um, and another thing just to touch upon is, is a kind of a full circle method of, of doing our floristry and really connecting in with all those different parts that we've mentioned today. So I'm just gonna finish with that. So, um, uh nurturing the soil and the soil health you know we're very keen on that we're growing things like herbs then when we cut and condition um we are you know we obviously um that's that's having a positive effect on our well-being these can then be used in bouquets that, that have a positive um impact on somebody else the conditioned leaves we use ourselves as dried or in dried um, teas this is another area we're really interested in. The offcuts and the waste go into compost um, and then the compost is used for, for mulching and that cycle is continuing. Um, so our final slide is just to, to leave you with a bit of inspiration, what inspires us. This is obviously not an exhaustive list, um, but it's, um, you know these are kind of people that are really inspiring us um and um and they're a variety whether it's to do with the organization such as land workers alliance or flowers from the farm whether it's you know really inspirational growers um or people who are using um really interesting sustainable methods um, new ways of working either with flowers or herbs or with um growing food um, and again some growing land management these are books that are we're currently or people that we're currently using um and getting great inspiration from and finally the refugee organizations that we support um and we just wanted to flag those um so yes thank you very much for listening and um we look forward to answering some questions brilliant thank you so much sarah and rory i really loved hearing your story thank you so so much i just can't i just love that color just this incredible burst of color it is so joyful so thank you so much for sharing that it's really beautiful to hear you speak openly about your past my i'm also from refugee jewish family origin my family le left the ukraine and russia lithuania so um, I'm really touched by the work that you're doing and I'm really pleased that you'll have the confidence and the courage to speak openly about willing to speak, to support refugee communities and I'm really excited to yeah to have that voice raised tonight. Um, so without further ado, it is my great pleasure to pass over to Camilla from Wolves Lane Flower Company, who will share their story. Thank you over to Camilla. Hi there. Um... Thanks so much for the invitation to talk tonight. It's great to be here. I've just got to say, I, I didn't plan on talking about this, um, but um, I'm 
in doing webinars like this and um, talking about what we're all doing, you learn so much about your own community. And um, Marianne and I have come into contact um, with Sarah quite a lot um, through Flowers from the Farm. And I've, you know, I've just learned a lot of things that we have um, in common that I never knew before. Um, so that's an amazing thing about um, doing this sort of thing. My family are also um, from, from Nazi Germany um, and they were Jewish and um, es escaped Nazi Germany. So that's, um, that's a very odd thing to have in common with someone. Um, also, I'm very jealous of your chipper. Um, Marianne showed me a picture of your chipper about two weeks ago and was like, we've got to get this right now. And I was like, we can't afford it. But it looks incredible and I'm gonna lust after it. Um, so I'm just gonna share my screen so that you're not looking at me. Um, and apologies if you hear my baby in the background who is currently playing some sort of game with my husband that I can hear. So I'm not sure if you can hear it. Um, so um, I am half of the Flower Company. Um, Marianne um, on the left would have loved to have been here, but she is um, imminently um, about to have a baby. She's not actually in labor yet, um, but she is supposed to be going into labor very soon. So she's on mat leave now. Um, so we um, started growing about four and a half years ago. Um, so we're still pretty new. Um, we are really, really micro. Um, so we really consider ourselves to be micro urban flower growers. Um, we're growing on this incredible site um, in London. Um, so it's quite unique, very unique to be growing actually inside London and not on the periphery. Um, the site is called Wolf Lane as well. Um, so we, um, we grow um, seasonal and sustainable flowers in London. Um, the site itself is three and a half acres. I wish we had three and a half acres, but actually what we've got um, is a 40 meter glass house, 40 meters by eight meters. There's a, there's a picture of one side of the glass house um, a couple of days ago. Um, and then what we've got are external plots that cobbled together makes up pr pretty similar to what Sarah and Rory have got. So, um, you know, a third of an acre. It's a South facing site, which is incredible but also quite unforgiving. Um, it's given the fact that it's in London, um, you know, London is about two degrees warmer than the rest of mainland um, England. So it's very warm. Um, and in the summer, we're experiencing um, the kind of heat that even I'd say 20 years ago when Marianne and I were, you know, growing up, um, that, that, that sort of heat in London, um, Marianne's gonna kill me actually, she didn't grow up in London, she grew up in Bristol, but um, um, that, that sort of heat would have been um, unimaginable. Um, it's London clay, so like Sarah and Rory, we are constantly adding organic matter. We also follow a no-dig approach um, for, me for many reasons. Um, it, um, but yeah, again, if you're, you don't want to be digging into clay, um, but it, it also means that quite a few seasons on, um, our beds are in really much better, much better shape due to like the no dig approach. Um, so a little bit um, about us. Um, we are, we're, we're not formally trained. Um, so, so sometimes it's a little bit intimidating talking to a network of growers. Um, that we had we had the time and the opportunity to um you know do city and guild or do rhs we would have done we're both really bookish people and i know we would have both loved to have done that but the the opportunity to grow at wolves lane um presented itself after quite a meandering journey um which is sort of a different webinar but <laughs> basically um we we had the opportunity to get space and to grow flowers um, at, at Walls Lane in the glass house and we and we just sort of had to take it when it presented itself even though we didn't really have a lot of experience and jumped into it quite naively um, but what I would say is that we get contacted a lot by career changers like ourselves who want to grow flowers and there is a certain paralysis 
um, in wanting to like always make sure that you've like read everything or done every course or got the qualification and actually in doing and failing epically you learn so much um, obviously it's worth reading and going on and, and doing qualifications like all of those things are you know incredibly useful but I'd say we've learned a huge amount through trial and error and we've really benefited and we made terrible mistakes in the beginning um, and we continue to make terrible mistakes and you know growing is a constant evolution in trying to be better and um, especially when you're growing like we do like Sarah and Rory like with you know an organic approach like we're chemical free you know that that's like, like all of you guys, like we all know how difficult that is. Um, and so you're constantly working on being a better grower. Um, so there's no sort of like start and end point. It's just, you're constantly in motion. Um, so um, a background about us, we, we were both producers. We, we met at university and then we both, you know, we still do live in London. So we, we were producers in our twenties and early thirties. Marianne worked in theater and dance and I worked in fashion. And um, we, um, we basically spent like a good decade, like looking at Excel spreadsheets and, um, you know, fulfilling other people's creative vision. And we were very lucky and privileged to work in very, you know, exciting um, industries, but they are quite wasteful industries. Um, and that is quite jarring when you're trying to live a sustainable life. And we had this like running joke of like a life of soil, you know, and we'd like just jack it all in, like be gardeners together and how wonderful it would be. Um, and, um, and then I quit my job and Marianne moved very close to Walls Lane and sort of discovered the site. Um, and so it was really quite serendipitous how, how it came together. Um, and, and we are really lucky to, to have the space in London and, and space for anyone. Um, it, growing in, in the UK is incredibly difficult. Um, so a little, a little bit um, about our ethos. So we're seasonal and sustainable. Um, I'm gonna come back to these slides later, but I don't think we need to go through them now. Um, seasonal and sustainable growers. And I, and I say seasonal and, you know, ev everyone's a seasonal grower, like, um, but when you're um, growing and selling flowers in London, um, seasonality or what people think is in season, um, is quite um, alarming because people's main relationship with flowers um, is actually with what can be bought at the flower market and they have or what they see at a florist shop or you know a lot of time what they see on Instagram um, so they have not a lot of connection um, the way that you would imagine um, and this is a massive generalization but the way that you would imagine people who live in more rural areas they have a, a quite a, a much stronger connection with what is in season um, than people that live um, in the city. There is a certain sort of plant blindness when, when, when you live um, in the city. Um, people just don't see things because they see the tube or they see the bus coming, but they don't see, they don't see a plant growing through the cracks. Um, so yeah, we, from the very beginning, we decided that we'd be sustainable and seasonal. Um, so sustainable meaning that we'd be chemical free. Um, if we ever had to work with stems that weren't our own, they, we would source them from other growers um, that would that, that share our ethos. Um, and in terms of our floristry, um, we've always been um, we've always been foam free. Um, so I don't think I need to like like preach to the choir here um, about why it's so important um, that florists um, work um, work without floral foam. Um, because even when they say it biodegrades, it doesn't. Um, it's actually quite damaging um, to marine life. Um, that's, um, that's been discussed quite a lot. Um, so one of the things that is on our side um, at Walls Lane is that we have this incredible location. Like we grow and sell flowers eight miles away from central London. We're, like, we're, we're so lucky um, to have um, that access to market what we what is very difficult in um in in our in this environment in the glass house is that and the fact that we're only growing on this like third of an acre is that it's a constant game of tetris so people are always asking us about 
you know, how do you make sure that you're always able to be like harvesting a crop? Like how do you make sure that you've got flowers from end of March to like beginning of November? And that is a life's work. That is not something that anyone can learn in, you know, four seasons like we've been growing, even if, you know, they come from, you know, even if they've done all the courses, like, you know, the growers that Marianne and I, you know, follow and talk to and, you know, really aspire to grow, like, most of these people have been growing, you know, for a few decades, not, not a few seasons. So we have, you know, we really are inspired by um, a lot of the growers that we've met um, through Flowers on the Farm um, and some of the growers that we um, follow in America. But yeah, we have to, we have to accept the fact that, you know, we're at the very beginning of this journey and we've got, we've got loads to learn. Um, so you've got the, but you've got the game of Tetris of like growing on a small space. And then you've got, you know, growing in a glass house is incredible. It extends your season. So we start, we start earlier and we end later than most people. Um, we're sort of cutting flowers um, well into November um, in the glass house, chrysanthemums. But psychologically, by the time we get to about the second week in November, like, we're like itching to just like rip it all out, clean the glass house out, um, you know, mulch the beds, get it all planted up with the hardy annuals that, that, that we've sown. So really like we could, we could continue to harvest flowers much later, but we actually don't because it's not viable for us. And we've, we've just got to get ready for, for the next season. Um, the glass house poses another problem, which is like pests. So growing under glass is just, you know, it's, a, it, it's warfare. Um, against um, aphids and spider mite and it's you know when you grow chemical you know in a chemical free way you um, prevention really is the best form of cure once you've got the problem it's really hard to get rid of it so we work a lot on making sure that we've got um, healthy plants that will be less susceptible to um, pest damage we use biological controls um, cleaning out the glass house is like the most odious task that we do all year. We, we actually just did it yesterday. Um, I say we, as in there was like a team of people, it wasn't just me. Um, and we, um, yeah, it's, it's really hard graph, but like we do that to hopefully um, minimize um, the pest problem the following season. What you can see in this photo on the left-hand side of that little snapshot of the glass house, on the right hand side of that photo is um, Ami Majus and that's when the crop has actually been cut down quite heavily after like um, a few weeks of harvesting it. Now that was two seasons ago. Last season for some reason the Ami just got absolutely infested and we tried and tried and tried um, to fix the problem but really we were too late and they left all the other umbellifers so we felt like oh you know We've been lucky, like they, you know, they, they've left the, the other umbellifers. So in the end, we just had to cut the crop out, and that um, that unfortunately is part and parcel of growing um, in a chemical-free way. Like you will, you will have crop failures, and, and you will have sometimes, you know, lose the battle against pests if, if you're not using chemicals. So we just had to really carefully cut the ami crop out, and I say carefully because actually, if you disturb um, the pest population, they are actually very intelligent and they will just migrate to another nearby similar crop. So just be, even though you're like screaming swear words at them, you've actually got to do it in a really like gentle, gentle way um, is what we've learned. Um, so um, this is our daily plot. Um, yeah, so a bit more um, about Walls Lane the site. Um, so it's a three and a half acre site in London, and it's a it's a it's a connect, collection of glass houses um, and external plots. And we're really lucky to share the site with some other fantastic growers, growers that some of you will know. Um, and we all grow with an organic approach. That's obviously really important to the site. Um, so the people that we share the site with are Organic Lee, um, Crop Drop. Um, and um, Edible London and Black Roots. So it's a really diverse site. Um, and Marianne and I, I, do, I think we have sometimes just thought how lucky we are to operate on such a diverse site and haven't actually realized um, 
how how diverse it is and how and how privileged we are to be part of that community and it's quite rare to operate on such a diverse site um especially when you look at um well magazines and how and how basically how horticulture is rep is represented in, in this country um so i don't want to waffle on too much about um about what about us i was going to give you some tips because robin said that you would want tips um but i did actually want to talk a little bit about um imported flowers because in the in the uk small scale flower movement so flowers on the farm and and the that community um we're always talking about sustainability and um obviously flying flowers from abroad um into europe isn't sustainable um but um none of these issues are binary um and we can't we can't really look at them um as if you know one thing is right and the other thing is wrong the reality is is that entire communities um rely on the income that that the cut flower industry provides so when we talk about um imported flowers um Marianne and I are trying to be increasingly more um, encouraging to florists who have to run a business that, in, that uses imported flowers. And there are hundreds, thousands of florists that operate like that in the UK. We just encourage them to ask better questions. Um, really, when we talk about sustainability, we're not only talking about you know, carbon emissions, we're talking about who grew your flowers. You know, what were they paid? Were they given PPE um, if they were handling, you know, toxic um, chemicals? Um, do they have like workers' rights? Um, you know, these are all questions that you know people would never consider asking when they buy a wrap of roses from the supermarket. When we talk about sustainability, we're talking about that entire the umbrella of sustainability, not not just carbon emissions, and given that so many florists um, run businesses where they are import where they're using imported flower stock, I think what we really need to be doing is getting people to ask the right questions because there are flower farmers out there that, that do do really good work. Um, Tambuzi is a really great one um, if, if people want to look up their work. Um, they're, they're the anomaly, um, so they're not, not not every flower farm is like that um you know in terms of chemical use um unless roses are fair or the flowers are fair trade have a fair trade accredit accreditation you just don't know um sort of what people were paid and um sort of the chemical use um so that's a bit of an aside to, to what we do but i guess because we're just entering this fallow period now where the two biggest flower festivals in the calendar fall so you've got Valentine's Day, Mother's Day that fall in the fallow period and florists are working with a huge amount of imported stems. You know, we're always trying to encourage people like, if you, if, if you have to have roses, if you have to have roses in February, okay, like it's, it, you know, we get it. Like it's not, it's not our choice, but you know, we respect yours, but where did your roses come from? Like who grew them? Ask those questions, keep asking them because if everyone asks those questions, then, you know, you, you can change, you can change an industry, hopefully. Um, so um, some tips um, about seasonal flowers. If, um, I think if we started again, people ask us this, like, you know, you know, mistakes we made, if, if you were starting again, what would you do? Um, you know, obviously in the beginning, we were all about the annuals, like sowing seeds. And actually, if we started all again, we would, really start with our perennials and our shrubs and that is what creates nuance and that is what makes your flower stock um, interesting and different to everyone else's um, you know if we had the space we would grow tons of like ribes and amelanchia and viburnum opulus um, but we don't and um, you know four years down the line um we um we're, we're, we're out of space but i think if we started again we would definitely um start with those things um i'd say also like love what you grow um you know 
in the age of Instagram and social media, there's just so much like flower imagery like everywhere and you know you can really think as a flower farmer like oh my god they're growing that we're not growing that and everyone loves that and it's like well do you like that like we grew lysianthus this season because um we can under glass um and they we bought them in like these really like you know sort of a think of like this tulip here and Bella Pock, you know it was that sort of like vibe of color that like everyone loves and like neither of us really likes Lysianthus that much. So we just didn't look after it in the way that we look, the way that we coss it, um, all the other crops that we grow. So yeah, really, really grow what, what, what you love and you'll look after it. Um, we'd, um, things that, um, things that we used to get really like worried about that, that and people ask us a lot about that, that we just don't worry about now is things like, you know, oh my god I've missed the boat on like planting bulbs it's like well no not really like we as flower growers you know we have a schedule we have to stick to that schedule for our insanity but if you didn't get your tulips planted in November and if the ground allows for it plant them in December plant them in January but just bear in mind they need that they, they, they need a cold snap so they, they need the colds to do well um big mistakes that we've made in the past that have cost us a lot of money bottom right hand corner that is our 2021 ranunculus um harvest which was like our best ever yet um but two seasons ago we just left we left it too late to chit the corms we started chitting the corms sort of like halfway through november which is just too late so like now we have it just in the calendar beginning of october we chit our corms and it doesn't matter what we're doing that's what we do um dahlias people are always asking us about like lifting dahlias we leave our dahlias in um three seasons and then we just pull them out and no we don't divide them we just compost them and we start again because who has the time um to be hosing down dahlias dividing them putting them into like their own like crate that is like labeled I mean I've already lost the plot I don't want to do that it's freezing cold um so we compost them and now in January I will be buying a whole new load of um daily like rooted cuttings and tubers and the only ones that will be growing again from last seasons are the ones where we were like we have to grow this like this was amazing so we don't want to do away with that like, and we, we don't we don't want the risk of you know, another, like new tubers not giving us um, flowers that were as, you know, good or plants that were as productive. So we, um, yeah, so we, we, we saved a few. Um, cutting, people are always asking us about cutting. So um, this dahlia here, um, I'm going to start with dahlias because people always ask us. So um, this one is kind of okay for cutting if you were doing a wedding. But what I'd say with like pom-pom dahlias is that you kind of, if you're cutting for a florist, you want to be cutting when um, the back of the flower is at about 180 degrees. Um, then when it starts to like flex back on itself, you're, you're really on borrowed time. Um, the other thing to like bear in mind with dahlias, unlike for instance roses, they won't continue to open up. So if you cut too early, you've like you've stopped that flower in its tracks. So there is a sweet spot. And the thing is with growing flowers and like learning about when the best point for cutting is, is that it's just it's another thing that you just have to go through, and you you have to like learn a lot as you go along and do a lot of reading and try it. Um, so roses, for instance. Um, Whereas, yeah, so like, you know, the roses all in this picture are like, are at like peak. This is like, you know, you're doing a wedding. This is what you want the roses to look like. If you cut the roses when they look like this, they will disintegrate within a day. So actually you cut the roses when the sepals have just like flexed back and then you're going to get four days of, of rose. Um, tulips, um, we we actually harvest our tulips i'm just trying to find a good tulip image um we actually harvest our tulips um when they start to show a bit of color so if the tulips were looking like this and in, in these images here like we've really missed the boat um those 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 top images there um you've really missed the boat on that so like 
we, we pull the entire stem out with the bulb um, and, and it's just when the top is starting to colour, we wrap them in brown paper, they're out of water, they're in a dark room, um, and that, that then means that your tulips won't blow. Something like a zinnia, like, I mean, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the wiggle test. So um, this is something that like Floric sort of coined, you sort of hold the stem 20 centimetres down and you give, it, you give it a shake. And if the stem moves sort of side to side a bit like a, the way that a metronome would, so like, I don't know if anyone plays piano here, but you, you had to practice using a metronome, which is a thing that ticks and it just moves like that, um, then, then it's fine to cut. But if there's any wiggle in the stem, then it's gonna flop, so it's too early. Um, California poppies, California poppies like have like a little, sort of little green cap um when they're all when they're still all twisted up and it's just when that green cap is um sort of coming away that they're good to cut and california poppies so poppies just in general people are like oh quite bothered to grow poppies like you know that's so annoying like they always blow they don't last they can last really well um but you just got to cut them um at the right time um or layer umbellifers in general you just can't cut them too early like our umbellifers start to flower in the glass house they look like they're starting to flower and we're just like there like gagging gagging to cut them but we've just got to like really like just take a breath and be like they're not ready because if you cut them too early um they will just flop and we sort of describe it as like imagine your hand holding like a tray and that's really what the flower head has to look like and all those tiny little petals that make up all the little individual flowers that make up the entire umbel they all have to be like, you know, holding the tray. Whereas what you'll actually notice really often with umbellifers is that they sort of, everything opens up like this. And if they're, if they're still like that, they're just, they're just not ready. Um, so um, other things that we would do differently and do better is we'd be really brilliant at composting and we would have really paid attention um, to soil science um, at school because, healthy soil is everything um and yeah i can't really stress that enough the soil is everything um and you just can't have healthy plants and like great flowers without without healthy soil so really actually our biggest expense at walls lane other than staff um is compost mulching um it's just you know we do a massive massive mulch at this time of year and then if anything is missed, um, you know, we do it in the spring, but the glass house in particular, because, you know, it's inside, it's not, hasn't, it's not part of like the same kind of like um, ecosystem that the external beds are like, we are constantly like really, really trying to um, add goodness into the soil. Um, primarily also, because it's a really aggressive way to grow. Like we are constantly harvesting, like we demand a lot of the soil. So we have to really, you know, invest in it and, and put, a, put a, a lot in. Um, and the final thing that I'd say for people that are new to growing and that want to grow um, is just don't take on too much. Um, I'd say one of the biggest mistakes Marianne and I made in the beginning is that we just, we tried to do it all and we tried to do it all too soon. And that was incredibly demoralizing. Um, and we failed more than we needed to fail. Um, I think Floret recommends that if you're new to flower farming, like brand, brand new, like never done it before, like don't take on more than a quarter of an acre. Um, and I think, you know, we, we would agree with that. Um, it, you know, quarter of an acre is already like a pretty, you know, you can grow a lot of flowers on a quarter of an acre. Um, and it's do fewer things and do them better um, rather than trying to do a lot. Um, you know, if, if you're new to growing, like, and you haven't and you haven't sown any hardies in the autumn so you, you've got you've got february coming up um you know so three three um hardy annuals in in february in march so three half hardies and buy some daily tubers and, and just start with that um because um flower farming uh yeah it can really consume you and and you know to to, to sarah's point like this, this is a massive labor of love all you know like no one 
no one growing on the kind of scale that we grow on in the UK is doing it because it's going to like make us like tons of money like we're doing it because we absolutely love what we do so let's really keep joy um, at, at the centre of that because you know it, it, it's a huge effort um just trying to think of any more tips oh yeah or layer final tip um i don't know if i've got an all layer pick actually but um no that's amy um but i think you guys all know what i mean when i say all layer um we only do an autumn sowing of all layer after like multiple seasons of um, then doing a spring sowing of all layer and then having a really rubbish crop we realize it's actually just not worth it. Um, Orle just is a cool crop and it loves, it loves the winter and um, it thrives and does really well. And then the spring sowing just never does. And Marianne and I came to this, um, came to this decision. And then um, I think on Instagram or on Instagram stories or something, um, Sal Robertson of Forever Greenflower Company, who is just like the biggest flower pro in this country said said the same and we were like oh my god what if Sal if Sal says that you shouldn't sow Olea in February then you really shouldn't um so yeah we're we're with Sal and we just don't bother um sowing Olea um in February um and that's it oh yeah what you can sow now you can sow sweet peas um so yeah if you've totally missed the boat and you just haven't sown anything um you can still sow sweet peas um I hope, I hope that was useful. <laughs> Thank you so much. Shall I stop share? Yeah, stop share. And then we can all, we can all come along. What I'm going to do is see if we can do it. See if it will let me add a spotlight. Oh no, it won't. Okay. So this is me on the moment working out all of the um spotlighting action so hopefully you can see all of us equally which should be good this is like a little mystery veg grower this is Susie she's hiding in the background she is uh, from the CSA network and she's sort of there to sort of like you know bump up any questions but she's hiding which is very sweet of her um so thank you so much Camilla I loved hearing all of your talk um so much I didn't know about what you do and like in terms of like where you are and the exciting things and then yeah so much detail so thank you so much for like your generous and exciting and interesting um presentation thank you and again to Sarah and Rory so we have loads of great questions I don't know if you've been looking at the question and answer while um um, it's been on. Um, Camilla, obviously you've been mid-flow, so you've not had an opportunity to look. So there's lots of exciting questions. Um, I am quite happy to allow the session to overrun. We I have got about 13 minutes to answer some questions, but we can maybe be a little bit fluid. If you've got children to look after, to put them to bed, then we can be very, very tight on our timings. But if there's space to run over, then we can also have a little bit of flexibility, but just uh, be vocal if you're like, no, I have to go. Um, so Sarah, Rory and Camilla, I don't know if there's questions that you've seen, if you want to have a quick look that you particularly want um, to answer. Some of them are very quick questions that you could maybe just type the answers to in the background and others are a bit more, um, yeah, a bit more dynamic. Um, I'm no good at doing things at the same time. So if I see a question, I can answer <laughs> it. I'll just answer it because I can't, I can't, I just, I'm multitasking. <laughs> Um, yeah. Someone, uh, Alice and Penny have asked, um, what do you use instead of foam for arrangements? Pretty much, um, you know, um, chicken wire and moss um, will do anything that floral foam can do. And actually, when you think of somebody like Constance Spry, who was doing floral arrangements for royal weddings, um, you know, not not yeah coming up to a century ago not not far off um you know 80 80 years ago i mean she didn't have floral foam floral foam was only um you know invented in the 50s um and she did it all with um um yeah basically wire and moss and the thing about sustainable floristry is that you just need to experiment none of it is like it's not, you know, it's like weird alchemy. Actually, all you need to do is like set aside a bit of time to, to, to try it out. Like we're constantly experimenting, seeing what will work and, and what won't work. And I think we're better, better florists for it. 
A book that we found really good um, on that topic was A Guide to Floral Mechanics. Um, yes. By Sarah Diligent and William. I'm sorry, I've just got it up here. I knew the William name. Mazurk, yeah. Yeah, yes, Sarah's Mazurk. written and, and they've got really good, um, really good drawings as well. Really Sarah amazing really good drawings, great. all about the different mechanics that you can use um, without, without using floral foam. And it goes into great detail. So I would highly recommend that book. Fantastic, thank you. Um, I am going to biasly ask uh, Marguerite's question because Marguerite launched a fantastic WhatsApp group in the Southwest, which has been really galvanizing and there's a really supportive, vibrant community there. And Marguerite's asked, is it possible to get an idea of both business income and an overview of the economics? Really interesting to know how micro farms can make it work. I don't know if you can speak to that at all. So what I would say to Marguerite is that growing flowers um, to sell, for instance, like wholesale, unless you're growing on an enormous, on a really big scale. So like sort of, you know, when I think of like um, Rachel Seafried um, from Green and Gorgeous, who's growing on like six acres, um, you have to really be growing on that sort of scale um, um, to, you know, if you were just doing wholesale, you know, someone like Sal grows on an, on an acre, but she also does like bouquets and she also does like weddings um so you have to be going on a massive scale to make wholesale work for small scale farms um you really need to monetize um in other ways you need to like you know you need to be able to sell a premium product so you know like sarah and rory like we run workshops we are actually taking a break from weddings this coming season but weddings is a massive part of our business um Selling flowers like by the stem is something that I would love to do, um, mainly because it would be much simpler than having um, all these other things and, uh, you know, trying to raise a very young family, working on the, the weekends is really difficult. But you, you, you have to be able to, um, yeah, to do a lot of things at the same time and have multiple income streams, um, really, is what I would say. I don't think we're in, um, well, the thing is that we've both been working part time and doing this part time and obviously we're setting up again. Um, so I don't feel that we're in a position at this moment um, to be speaking to this question, but uh, and also Camilla, you've answered this really well. And I think it is just having multiple income streams um, and um, and it is still possible to to you know have a have a decent monthly income, be able to cover the costs. Um, but we again, we're still we're just setting up again. So it'll be really interesting for us to see on this larger scale. But we you know even in the garden, on a garden scale, small garden scale, we we were managing to make an income. Brilliant. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so there's lots of sort of technical questions. Um, one thing you kind of touched on when you talked about perennials, you said, and this is a question from Harriet Mullins. So how do you balance true seasonality with making a profit? It's kind of similar to maybe leading on from what you've just talked about. She said, I'm trying to only use what is truly seasonal rather than other British flowers grown with heat and light. We, I mean, I, I'd be really interested to hear what Camilla's saying, but for us at the moment, um, we're using dried flowers in the winter months. Um, and we're really interested, the Saw Collective, um, which is double S A W Collective. And then um, I know there's amazing work being done by um, Fiona, Electric Daisy Flower Farm, you know, looking at kind of spring bulbs and kind of really changing um, the conversation around what could be sold for, for Valentine's Day or for Mother's Day and kind of, um, you know, um, plants in pots and snowdrops. They did a snowdrop festival, which was amazing. Um, but for us at this moment, we're looking at dried only in the winter, but yeah, we're gonna have to see. Um, yeah, we, we don't, um sell fresh flowers in the fallow period so we only operate with with dried flowers um, and we look forward to this period I know it sounds disingenuous like we're flower farmers presumably we should want to be cutting fresh flowers all the time but we like we need this break in the season you know we have colleagues and people that we follow that live in parts of the world where there is no fallow period. There is no differentiation between seasons. And I just don't know how they do it because they're on this constant, constant never ending cycle of farming flowers and cutting flowers. And that, that point in the season, so for us from about like April through to 
like when it starts to slow down again in September, it's just relentless. If we had to live like that the year round, it, it would be very difficult for the kind of operation that we're running. Um, so we really look forward to this period, but yeah, it is, it is just fried flowers. And that's a real shift for people like, you know, we're doing a wedding in February. And I said to the bride, I was like, it can only be foliage and dried flowers. And she was totally game. So, so are we. Right. Mm. Right. That sounds fantastic to have that conversation. One of the things I really liked, Camilla, you were talking about is, you know, inviting people to ask the right questions, ask, you know, having people think about things when you say, actually, this time of year, that is what is available, you know, and really have that conversation with people. Yeah. Yeah, it's really about educating the consumer um, and really just empowering people to make um, informed decisions about what mm -hmm. they want to buy. Yeah, brilliant. So we've, some of the, we've got some questions that maybe you could, um, there's a few things like I knew there would be these like excited growers, they want the top tips, like for, uh, for asks around foliage and perennials. I wonder if we could maybe, after this, if you could maybe do a little list for us, and then I've got the emails from everybody who signed up for tonight, and I could send them actually a list of emails instead of you kind of frantically trying to write down Latin names and remember everything. How does that sound to you? Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I can give it a shot. Yeah. So that's so questions around foliage and fillers and suggestions for what to start with and perennials. We can put those in a list for you, and we'll email them out to you so we can answer them that way for you. Yeah. One thing was interesting, there's a lot around kind of like the business aspect of this, you know, which I think is really important as well as people have asked around, you know, how do you go about costing your stems or your bouquets? And also, how do you find your customers? How do you reach out to people? Um, well, we have done a number of different courses with Organic Blooms. We've done sales advanced flower farming workshop and she's absolutely amazing. Uh, showing you you know she's got spreadsheets and formulas and is re you know really um uh explains the importance of costing things properly um and the business of selling flowers is another i mean we've not done that one but it comes Very highly good. recommended um and i can see julia bedford asked a question about how we um who we sold to and to start with it's all been through instagram um and you know we've we've managed to um uh build our customer base through instagram largely and we're now going to try and get people um engaged with our newsletter um you know to kind of secure to secure our contacts really but um yeah doing doing those courses definitely um you know that, that's been hugely beneficial to us hasn't it mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, I agree with everything you've said. <laughs> <laughs> then you talked a little bit, you talked quite in a lot of detail, Camilla, about your harvesting. And it's different for every flower, different, every plant, obviously, and dependent on your site. So I suppose, you know, there's another question about asking for good harvesting tips. I don't know if either of you have got anything you wanted to add or you feel that you kind of said your main points when you were talking? Um, the, th the thing with, um, I think that question is, is um, really about um, how to harvest quickly. Um, uh, so the thing that we would say when you're harvesting flowers, especially um, in the summer, is you've got to do it really early. This is not for people that like to sleep in. This is actually not really for anyone who likes to have a life, but given that anyone um, on this webinar is a grower, I think um, none of us have got lives anyway. Um, so um, what I would say is you've got to be up really early and you will inevitably be more efficient for, for, for being up early. And also um, what a lot of growers do, we actually don't do this. Um, we cut to, um, I make sure that I'm cutting um, in like tens or twenties, it depends what the crop is. Um, and then um, I note it down. I know that other people, um, they have like a little store elastic band and they cut like in the twenties and they wrap an elastic band um, around like every 20 stems. We don't want to be using lots of elastic bands so we don't do it that way, but by cutting to an even number, so. If, because I know I'm cutting in 20s, then I make a note of that and then um, and then I divvy up that stock amongst all the orders. But it, growing and harvesting is all about having systems and 
you develop these systems, um, the more experienced you are. Brilliant, thank you. Right, well, I think we're actually, we've kind of covered most of the most of the kind of technical questions. There is so much I would love to talk to you about more. Um, and I think, you know, independently of this, I think we'll definitely carry on the conversations. We're really keen to, as the Landworkers Alliance, really keen to highlight the work of UK flower growers and really kind of shout about what's happening within that sector. Um, as we come to a close, I wanted to remind you about the next webinar that is happening just before I say my thanks and close officially. So just while you're all here, get your pen and paper and make sure you don't forget. So our next webinar, is a continuation of our Seeds Are Our Stories. And I'm very, very excited because this also is gonna include one of my dear friends. So I'm just gonna read the, the, the review from the blurb from Sinead, who's the program leader for our, the Seed Sovereignty Program, which I also work on. And she says, based off the popularity of our event last year, we're back for more fireside seed stories to warm your winter and get you ready for the growing season ahead. A special seed week event featuring seed workers from our networks and stories of the seeds that connect them to their homes and their heritage. And we'll be hearing the stories from three different seed growers, these incredible people. One is Cole Gordon. He's a seed researcher and baker who's based on his family farm in the Scottish Highlands. Then Ioni Rojas, who's a dear friend of mine, She's a food grower, a multidisciplinary artist working with the earth, plants, animals, and people. And Dennis Tuliatos, I really apologize, apologize if I didn't say your name correctly there, Dennis, is an interdisciplinary researcher with a background in plant biology and environmental social sciences. And this will be on, let's make sure I've got the right date. What date is this? Maybe Susie can help me. Susie, are you posting this in the chat? What date is our next session? Oh, it's be the last, um, the 26th of January at 7 to 8.30. This will be the continuation of our webinar, so don't forget that. And so to close, with my absolute heartfelt, sincere thank you to Sarah and Rory for your time today and everything you're doing in the way that you care for the earth, you grow flowers and you spread joy, creativity and connection. And thank you to Camilla and, and Marianne we wish her all the best with her safe delivery. And thank you again for everything you're doing and saying equally spreading such beauty. And it's really just, it was really wonderful to spend this evening with you. And thank you to everybody who came. And we look forward to continuing this conversation with you all. And we look forward to joining you again in January for Seeds Are Our Story. So thank you all so, so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Goodbye everybody. Bye. Bye.